So tonight I really want to do just kind of an introduction to a new series that I want to begin. Uh, we'll look at Romans chapter 2 in a moment, but this study will actually be in the book of Matthew. But I want to, I want to begin tonight by looking at um, a couple of different passages, so I'll ask you to keep your Bibles open. Uh, we'll start there in a moment in Romans 2, but let's take a minute to uh, to pray and then we'll begin our time together tonight. Father in heaven, I do ask for your grace, pray for your strength, Lord, that you would feed us through your word, that you would teach us and help us to see Christ in the scriptures. We ask this in his name, amen. Well, I want us to um, think for just a moment tonight, and, and I, I have uh, been here for a, a long time, and many of you have been followed my preaching over the years, and, and know that uh, from time to time that I have um, referenced some things in the scripture that um, uh, in terms of, for example, when we were in 1 Samuel, we talked about seeing uh, Christ in 1 Samuel. And, um, and, and sometimes I make these illusions, I'll, I'll say these things, and sometimes we're really pointed in how we do this, but other times we just make references or um, make a, a statement uh, like Jesus being the true Israel, uh, things like that. And, and, and I don't know how those things come out when you hear those things, but, um, but tonight I want to press in on that a little bit more. I want us to, to, to push ourselves in how we look at the scriptures. And, and certainly as we think about David, uh, going back to that first Samuel study, one of the things that we highlighted was that um, um, David represented Christ. I mean, as he, as he faced Goliath, and, and you can't escape this in looking at the text if you're looking for this, uh, you see that when David uh, fights a Goliath, that the, the scripture makes it very clear that he fights on behalf of Israel. Now, typically in our man-centered kind of interpretation, the way that we want to look at that is we want to think of ourselves as Davids and, and uh, we want to think of ourselves as defeating the Goliaths in our life. And certainly there could be some application for that, but we have to look at the scriptures and, and really understand what the scriptures teach us about how we're to look at, the, look at them. I mean, even Jesus himself on... Uh, the, the road to uh, Emmaus when he met with those disciples. You recall that in that Luke passage that he, he actually, I think it's Luke 24, he, he refers to um, as he you know, comes to the disciples, they don't recognize him uh, because he keeps, uh, keeps himself from, from them being able to recognize him. He starts with Moses and the prophets and he shows them throughout the scriptures how it's all about him. And all this points to him. And so, nothing new, but I mean, we primarily have an approach to the Scripture. Either the Scripture is about us and how we should live our life, or either it's about Christ and how we live in response to Christ. That may be a kind of an easy way to sum things up, um, but just using or thinking about the way that the Scriptures speak about Christ, it is ultimately, even if you look at the, the Old Testament, uh, much of what we see there is to point us to Christ. All the, we, would, we would not argue that those offerings um, that we see in Leviticus, all that, uh, is pointing us to Christ. I mean, all this is fulfilled in him. And so when you think about the David story and you think about David, they're fighting on behalf of Israel. They're, um, he's uh, the, the winner of the, the fight between David and Goliath wins the victory for the other side. And so they're they're like federal heads as they come out. And, uh, and so, obviously, we, we see that, that Christ is the one who has defeated the greater Goliath. Uh, Goliath, even when he's pictured in that uh, passage of Scripture, we highlighted that uh, his armor is said to have scales on it. Is, is that to make us to think about the serpent? Uh, or is it just scales? Uh, do we believe that, that the Scripture and I want to be clear about this, we do believe that that was a literal event, 
that it, it happened. Uh, God gave David the victory, but we believe that it points us to the ultimate victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that these things that we see in Scripture, we ought to understand them, the plain meaning of the text, understand what the Scripture is saying, but we also ought to look at the overall narrative of redemptive history. And so how does this fit in, in terms of redemptive history? And, and what we see is that the greater David, and that's where in the New Testament, I mean, he's spoken of the, the son of David. I mean, you know, th this is over and over. You, you're seeing David, the fulfillment of that kingly line that's promised uh, is in the person of Christ. Well, I, I'm kind of overwhelmed as I start thinking about some of these things because I've been, this is something that I've been working on for a long time and thinking about and studying and and uh, and it's and it's somewhat um, as you begin to kind of put this out there. I know that for some of us talking in this kind of way, um, some people get a little nervous because you you start talking about allegories or you start talking about patterns in scripture, and you and you uh, you get some strange and peculiar looks because a lot of us have been taught and coming through the scriptures. I you know I went to Bible college and seminary. And, uh, and they were very systematic about the way that you're approached the scriptures. You know, if this is, this is this kind of writing, you approach it this way. If this is the kind of writing, you approach it this way. But is that it? I mean, is there, is there only one uh, lens that we're to look through, or is there more? And, and, I, and what I'm arguing for tonight, pleading my case before you tonight, is that there is a plain meaning of the text but then we should also be looking at how this fits within redemptive history. And so how does this fit with the overall narrative of what God is doing? And that's where we can make the application about David securing victory for us, not, over, not only defeating the serpent and crushing the head of the serpent, but ultimately defeating the greatest of life, which is death. And so he has secured the victory on our behalf. So we see that. It's a Christ-centered approach to Scripture. Um, and, and again, this doesn't take away from the literal victory that our Lord gave to him, but it does point us to something greater. And so what I want to do tonight is uh, I, I just want to look at some different passages. I've um, obviously coming out of this study in Ephesians, there's a lot that uh, we've been kind of thinking about in terms of the circumcision and the, the uncircumcised, and I think this kind of fits with, uh, maybe gives an opportunity to talk about um, how we look at Scripture, even using that tonight. But, um, but should we approach the Scripture in this way? I mean, should we um, look at it in terms of looking at the patterns and the allegories and things like that? And, uh, and, and can you go too far? Well, yeah, you, I mean, I'll just say right up front that you can go too far with that stuff. There, there, is, um, there, there is a possibility that you can, you know, see things that are not there. And so, uh, and there's the possibility that you can force things into the text that, that are not really there. And so, there is a caveat. There is a warning that is there. We should keep that in mind. But there's also the, a, a great possibility, a probability, I should say, that we don't go far enough, that we miss Christ in the scriptures when it's all over the page. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll look for those things that are there. Um, I, I will say that this kind of interpretation, and this is something, this school of uh, hermeneutics, if you will, that I've been working through is not something that I embraced quickly. It's not something that, um, that I came up with my own, on my own. I've been influenced by a lot of folks, and, and don't get the idea that I'm just going to start being a different preacher start Sunday morning. I'm just, I'm just pushing us a little bit on Wednesday night. So um, what I'm asking is just come off the bank, and we're, we're just going to walk out a little bit further into the deep part, just, just a little. And uh, if I get too far in the deep end, you know, just pull me back. But, but this, is, this is just stretching us a little bit. So these men that... Um, um, like Peter Lightheart, uh, James uh, B. Jordan have had a tremendous impact on I me. Mean, there are others uh, along those lines, but even those men are not men who came up with 
and interpretation on their own, but rather they've drawn from the Puritans and throughout the, the, the uh, church fathers and the, and the early church. I mean, this stuff has been throughout the centuries. And again, sometimes it goes too far, but there are some things in there that we can glean. But where about those men? I mean, where do they get those things? And that's where the one I want to kind of focus on tonight is, is uh, if we start broadening the way that we look at the, the scriptures and the, and the narrative of uh, redemptive history, where do we get that from? Do we see that? Should we, how do we see, do we see anybody else in the Bible doing that? And that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit. So I, I just have just a few, a few thoughts that I want to share um, that I think will aid us in our approach tonight about how we approach the scripture. And, uh, and, and the first thought has to do with this is just kind of considering uh, how scripture came to us. And, and I'm and I really want to, I want to not, not so much go back to the canon and, 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 you know, hammer out, no pun intended, those, those details. But rather, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about, uh, for example, a Jewish family that, say, 2,000 years before Christ came. They didn't have, they didn't have access. Obviously, there was no, no, there was no printed Bible. I mean, we take for granted uh, the Bible. They didn't have a printed Bible. Um, the scriptures were recorded, but it wasn't like they were mass produced. It wasn't so. So a lot of what you had is this, this uh, you know, oral tradition where where the, the scriptures are repeated, and the scripture makes it very clear. Romans ten chapter, Romans chapter ten verse seventeen that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. The word was meant to be heard, and 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 this is the the, the emphasis that I want to place on how we think about our interpretation of the scripture is that God intended and in, in from the beginning that the word was to be heard. And so if the word is to be heard, then he, I think he helps us. There are mnemonic aids that are there to, to help us remember. I think part of those patterns that we see are there to, to help us remember. Have you ever read the story of the patriarchs and it feels like I've just read this story before? I mean, you're reading a story about Abraham and you're reading the story about Isaac, and, and you're, you're kind of working through those things, and you're thinking, man, I just read that story. And I, and I think those things are there to trigger. It's, it's to help us to remember. And so I, I believe that the, the Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and, and so these, these patterns, these, these, uh, this repetition that is there, these were literal events happening in these, the life of these people, but their, their stories are, are very similar, and, and those things are there to help us to Put those things together. We've talked about this before, but in the garden, for example, uh, we see in, in the beginning with Adam, and as Adam is in the garden, uh, you, you see this imagery of that uh, Adam being there in the garden, the literal garden, yes, Garden of Eden, him and Eve are there. Serpent comes, he falls in the garden, pushed out of the garden, exiled, and then we don't see a garden again until Noah. And what happened with Noah? You remember Genesis chapter 6, where after, um, that opened up a whole new, <laughs> God was sorry that he created man, and wipes out mankind and just preserves this one family, but there's a new creation. And it all starts over again in the garden. And so here's Noah, there in the garden. Now, are, are we to put those things together, that it's a new beginning and it's a new, I think we are. Um, and, and this is not out there somewhere. I mean, even Paul, when he talks about the Lord Jesus, he refers to him as the last Adam, which not only refers to him in the, in the sense of a federal head, but also it helps us connect things like when we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, reminds us that the last Adam was faithful when he was tested, whereas the first Adam failed. When we see... After the resurrection, when uh, Mary mistakes Jesus as a gardener, what's going on there? Is that not to trigger in our mind that this is a new world, this is a new creation, and may help us to think about Noah? Y'all doing all right? So what, what I'm saying is, is, that, is, is that these things are in the scriptures, these patterns are there, 
can you go too far with that? Yes. But can we not go far enough? Ultimately, what we're looking at is these things, all of these events took place. And we should see that as the plain meaning of the text, that it's literal. But we should also understand that these are, these are things that we can see pictures of and help us understand the person and the work of Christ. And so that's what I'm pushing for, is that is understanding this. Um, when we talk about um, uh, Melchizedek, for example, the high priest um, that's mentioned in Hebrews, you know, that, that Jesus is, a, is in the priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? Well, if you, if you study that, Hebrews chapter 7, you spent much time there, you know that uh, he, was a, he was both a king and a priest. And so, so, so I mean, there's, there's things that we go back to the history and we see who the Melchizedek was and how Abraham, who had the priesthood in his loins, bows to the king of Salem, which is Melchizedek. Well, that tells us that the, that the priesthood is subservient to, I mean, the, the, the Melchizedek order is the highest order. He's both king and he's priest. And, and this is not even in my notes. I mean, I'm just, this is just study. I mean, this is just thinking through these things and, and working through this. And, but all that to say, that there are these, these triggers that are there, these mnemonic aids. There, there are things that are there to, to help us remember, the patterns that are there. Certainly, we've talked much about the, chaos, the, the chiastic structures that are there. Those are, those are tools to, to help us uh, remember and learn those things. We don't, we don't really benefit from it because, in a lot of ways, we miss it because we don't, we don't know the Hebrew language. But it was there, and it would do us well to, to dig in and it doesn't mean that there aren't things like those imageries that I talked about that we can't glean from. And so they're, they're there. We just have to look and see. And, and once you start um, uh, looking through these eyes and once you begin to look and see these things, you, it, it, will, it will really begin to open up your Bible. There's so much that's there. Um, the, the second thing I would, I would just mention uh, well, before I move on about the about the, the the Old Testament and some of the history, the tradition, there is um, uh, there's also a lot of play on words. Um, uh, for example, when we were in in, in Ruth uh, several years ago, you recall that um, when they left, there was no no uh, there was a famine in Bethlehem. Uh, you know, we we hear that and it doesn't really mean anything to us and. I mean, it does, but it just means that they were hungry and they, they left. You know, there's a famine in Bethlehem, and so they go down, um, run into Moab. Well, to the, to, uh, yeah, they go to Moab to go for bread, to go for food. Now, as I say that, is that, is that ringing any bells for you? Is that, is it, is it help when you think about that they were in Bethlehem, which is the house of bread? And there was a famine in the land. And they went down to the Moabites who would not give them bread when they left out of Egypt to get food. Does that kind of help you to think a little bit more about, well, maybe there's, maybe there's something else here. Maybe there's more to this. And, and what I'm saying is, is that, yes, there, there, is, there was a literal famine. But don't miss this big picture of what God's doing in Scripture. And don't miss the, the, the story of redemptive history by just planting your face there and missing the broader picture. So, so look for the plain meaning, but also look and understand what else is there. And, and this kind of fits with what we've been talking about in um, what Paul has been talking about in Ephesians with the circumcision. I want to go back to Romans chapter 2 and verse... Um, We'll start in verse 25 tonight. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. Um, and by the way, just one more I would just throw out there, just kind of as a, as a reference, just to 
think about uh, these polar opposites. Um, this is nothing new. I mean, you, most of you probably heard this, but I mean, you've got the Tower of Babel where God comes down and confuses the language of the people. That's Genesis 10. What's the polar opposite of that? Well, in the New Testament, in the, you know, after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and causes those people to be able to hear what the foreign tongue is saying in their own language. So are we to put those things together? Well, yeah, 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 I think we are. I mean, I think that's, that's what we're to look at. How does this fit in redemptive history? What's God doing? Well, as we talked about last week, one of the things he's doing is gathering all unto himself. You know, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. I mean, he's, he's the, the summing up of all things in Christ. And he's bringing unity. He's bringing uh, his people together. He's, he's bringing in the multitude. So Romans chapter 2, verse 25, we've been talking about circumcision. And just... Uh, as a point of what I want, to, want us to see in this is, is really looking at uh, what Paul is telling us about, um, in particular, how we, uh, ha- how we should see the Jewish people. Because, um, because our tendency is to look at things in a literal or physical way. And, and certainly there is, as I've emphasized, there, there is that that we should consider. But even in circumcision, it was meant to point them beyond the literal circumcision. It wasn't just supposed to be about the physical, but it was something spiritual there. So you see in Romans chapter 2, verse 25, where indeed circumcision is a value if you practice the law. That's the value in it. You know, they were, they were circumcised. The Jewish people were circumcised. And so they were, it was a mark of the covenant. It's a value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. This is where we talked about last time in Ephesians that the the so-called circumcision. Why? Because they were transgressors of the law. In fact, Paul goes on later on to talk about this, and and some of this is here, but but actually, if you are if you are a circumcised Jew and you are a transgressor of the law, actually you are bringing judgment upon yourself by being a circumcised Jew. So the circumcision actually becomes a judgment because they, they're, they're professing to be what they are not. But notice how he speaks to, he speaks to the Jews, but then he speaks to the Gentiles, Romans 2.26. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Do I need to read that twice? You, I mean, you, you see what that's saying? It's pretty simple. That's the justification of the Gentile. But then it comes back to the judgment again. But look at verse 27. And he who is physically uncircumcised, I'm talking about a Gentile, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? So what's the takeaway? Here's the takeaway in verse 28 and 29. This is what we've emphasized the last couple of weeks, is that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is in the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. So, so putting all this together, the, what the Apostle Paul tells us about the true child of God, the true Jew, is that it's not an outward symbol. It's not something of the flesh such as circumcision. No, it's inwardly. He's talking about a godly heart, a circumcised heart. It's not by the letter of the law, but, but notice it says in there it's by the Spirit. And, and I would just emphasize from our teaching that this is a work of the Spirit. The salvation is a work of the Spirit. It comes by God himself. Um, he continues this. I, I'm not going to take the time to go to chapter 3 and 4. Um, but there's a, there's a lengthy discussion. I will just highlight this as he's talking about circumcision, and some of us probably are, are familiar with this. But if you go back and read the Abraham account, uh, Genesis 12, the calling, and then, and then um, 
his, uh, his actually where he's credited with, with righteousness, which is in um, 13 and 15 is where the, uh, or 15 and 17 is where the, he's credited as righteousness for believing in God by faith, not by his works, but then he doesn't actually become circumcised until after that. And this is what Paul argues in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 4, is that basically at the time that he was credited as righteousness before God, recognized with a circumcised heart really, he was not yet physically circumcised. Why is that? Because he's the father of faith to both the Gentile and to the Jew. He was actually converted. Uh, at, I mean, that's when his, um, he was reckoned as righteous at that time before his physical circumcision. Where are you going with all this? That's a good question. I, I, I'm, where, where I'm going with this is that is to push us in looking at what Scripture says. And, and sometimes we get so caught up in the literal and sometimes we get so caught up in, in, in what's right there that we miss the spiritual lesson that is there. And I think this is really applies to Israel. And I know that there's been a lot of teaching over the years, especially in our lifetime, about Israel and the understanding about who is Israel. But as we already emphasize in these first couple of verses, he's already telling us who the true Jew is, and he, he doesn't miss this. He doesn't mince words. In fact, go to Romans chapter 10 for a moment. Chapter 9, let's go to chapter 9. Very familiar passage, you know, where Paul is broken over the condition of, of, uh, of the Romans, or excuse me, he's broken over the condition over his uh, countrymen. And in this passage, he, he makes a, uh, uh, his, his, he, he makes a distinction between national Israel and spiritual Israel. And in other words, he's making a distinction between the true Jew and those who are his Jewish kin, kinsmen. And he's broken for the Jewish kinsmen. He, he wants his brothers, um, Jewish brothers, to come to Christ. Look at verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. By the way, as you read that, does that not, Ephesians, what we've been reading about, does that not come to mind about we were far away, but we've been brought near? And all, all these things are, are right here. We're seeing them. This is who promise. He's broken over. Who are the fathers and are from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. But look at verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. He, he's broken over his Israel. He's broken over his Jewish kinsmen because they're not coming to faith in Christ. The one that's been promised through them, they're not coming to faith in Christ. But what he makes it very clear is that the word of God has not failed because this is why. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So there is a distinction. There is an Israel, but then there is an Israel. Nor, verse 7, are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So the true Israel is made up of those who, like Abraham, have been credited righteousness by grace through faith. And you see this theme running here. So, so Paul is making a distinction between the true Jew and those who... Um, are physical Jews, the spiritual and the fleshly. And here he's making uh, the same distinction as he talks about it in terms of Israel. But there's a difference between the national Israel and the spiritual Israel. And, and again, you see this. Turn, turn to Galatians chapter 3 for a moment. And you see this theme running throughout the Scripture. 
In Galatians chapter 3, we've been looking at it a lot in Ephesians, but in Galatians 3, where Paul writes um, in verse number 6, even so, Abraham believed God and it was credited, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. There, there's that reference to Genesis 15 which is before Genesis 17, which is where he was circumcised. <clears throat> Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith who are sons of Abraham. Let me read that again. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith who are sons of Abraham. So who are the sons of Abraham? Those who are of the faith. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So the, the descendants of Abraham are those who make up the true Israel, are those who have placed their faith in God. It's been credited to them as righteousness. And you see that understanding there. You see, that, so that's the distinction that I'm making. I, I'm not, I just want to be clear that this is what Paul is doing. He's, he's pushing us beyond the physical to see the spiritual meaning in that. And there's one last thing I'd like to highlight, and um, we could go all over the scriptures, but since we're right here in Galatians, we'll just flip over to chapter 4 for just a moment. Look, look at verse 21. And this is, this is kind of how Paul, Paul approaches. So we, we've talked about these clues that are there, that the, that the Scripture is meant to be heard. And so um, God has given us this understanding. Of one of the, he's given us so many aids there to, to help us to remember things. There's repetition that's used. There's patterns that are used. Uh, there's numbers that are used that um, have significance. We see that there's, there's both a physical and a spiritual meaning in, in some of these passages like what we just looked at. But then here he gets in a, a, a category that a lot of us get uncomfortable with, and that is allegories. And so he talks about allegories. I, I remember in my uh, class in, in uh, Bible college, and the... the, the the teacher was very clear about this. You can only use an allegory where it says it's an allegory. And so this is one of those cases right here. And, uh, and, and the point is, is that uh, what he was trying to, what he was really wanting to communicate is that, is that uh, you can't just have a liberal interpretation. You can't just come at this and see allegories everywhere. And here's the question I would just pose for you to think about tonight. It, is... And when Paul does this, is he, is he giving us just an allegory, just something uh, that's an anomaly that we don't see anywhere else in the New Testament? Or is he teaching us and showing us that this is a way that we ought to look at Scripture? Um, beginning in verse number 21, he says, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who is a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Now, we've already heard this. We're children of promise. But at that time, he who was 
born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now also. So he's helping the Galatians to understand why the Jews are coming after them, why those uh, Judaizers um, who were coming with a false gospel and they were persecuting and attacking the church. We see this in the apostolic era. We, he, he gives us some understanding why this is, because they were of the flesh. And by the way, um, well, let me finish this. But what does the, verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Now, rather, rather than spending all our time walking through this passage and teaching it tonight, let me just kind of highlight a couple of things about this allegory that Abraham has two sons, one by a bondwoman, one by a free woman, and we can see that. One of them is born according to the flesh. Hagar gave a son Ishmael, right? And one through the promise. He's doing the same thing that he did earlier. He's contrasting what he done, what he does in Romans between the letter of the law and the spirit, between that which is operating in faith and that which is in the flesh, contrasting these two things. And it culminates there in verse 25 uh, when he when he ties Hagar. Now think about this. If you're a Jewish person and you're tied to the law and you love the law, he's tying Hagar to Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now what happened to Sinai? That's where the Ten Commandments come. He's, he's tying the fleshly to Mount Sinai and also present Jerusalem. And the Spirit, the one of promise, verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free, is our mother. Now, what does that mean? Well, we, we, we talked a little bit about Hebrews 12 a couple weeks ago, and We'll just go there again right quick. Just, just real quickly. I'm, I'm going to close it out right here. Huh? Hebrews 12. But one, one of the things that we see in this is that there, there's a difference between the, the physical Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. I mean, our, as Paul says in, in Philippians that our citizenship is in heaven. Remember when we were looking at the blood of Christ, and we talked about the blood of Abel, and that Christ's blood speaks greater things. Let me just read. I, I, I don't even have to elaborate. Let me just read in Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. Exodus 19, 20. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You, you see the difference between the fleshly and the spiritual? I mean, we just looked at a couple of passages. I mean, it's, it's not like these things are obscure or hidden. They're there. So, so when we come to the Scriptures, and I, I just want to go back to Matthew for, we never got there, but I just want to go to Matthew 1 and, and finish with this thought. Uh, and I just want to give you a taste. This is something that um, I, I heard Warren Wiersbe uh, bring out several years ago, and um, some of you may be familiar with, with Wiersbe. But even he, who, I, you know, I mean, I say that to say that even those who uh, may not take this kind of approach to Scripture and seeing these things like that, you just can't deny some of the stuff that's here. So, uh, so just, just in closing, let me just, just kind of highlight, uh, and we're going to go deeper in this when we go, but, but just kind of highlight 
something that you can easily see that there is a parallel in the first seven chapters of Matthew, there's a parallel with the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. How do you see that? Well, the first book is Genesis, and chapter 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. So, Exodus is next. What should we expect to see in chapter 2? Well, make no mistake about it. We see the flight from Egypt. Look, look at chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And I want you to really see this, that when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph the dreamer. Hmm. And said, get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, he called Israel out of Egypt. And this passage is from the book in the Old Testament I'm trying to think of right now. Um, help me, what? Hosea. Hosea. But he applies, Matthew takes a, a, a specific passage that is talking about Israel and says, this is, to, this is fulfilled in Christ. Christ is the true Israel. We said it differently a while ago. We said the true Israel are those descendants of Abraham. Going a step further, the true Israel is Christ, and the true Israel are those who are in Christ. But, but if we, we see the genealogy in Genesis, uh, we see the Exodus in chapter 2. In chapter 3, I, there's more we'll, we'll get into, but certainly you can see um, the acceptable offerings in Leviticus. Uh, just taking the last part of the baptism of Jesus where he says, um, God says from heaven that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Again, that's, that's kind of a, it's not deep, but, but it's there. Uh, we're going to go deeper. But verse 4, the temptation of Jesus. How does that correspond? Well, Numbers is when Israel goes into the wilderness and is tempted and they fail. Here Jesus is led by the Spirit and goes into the wilderness And is tempted and is obedient. So what's next? Five, six, and seven is the law. Deuteronomy. Which Deutero is two namos law, the second law, the second giving of the law. Here it is. Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. So that's that's just one way of kind of thinking about that. That's just a a real nominal read. I mean, you, you, you could see that, right? But again, I think there's so much more. And I want to push this. And so we're, we're going to, in the weeks ahead, dig in a little deeper. And I got the feeling better while I was preaching. So I hope you do. But let's pray together and we'll close out tonight. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the word of God. For we know that it does point us to Christ, and we thank you that it is your Holy Spirit who illuminates the Word. And that's what I'm asking, God, that you would bring light, that you would teach us, that you would grow us, that this uh, study uh, would begin to um, have its um, impact on us, that not, we'd, not that we would become puffed up, but Lord, that we would, through the the hearing and the doing of your word, uh, that we would become more and more like Christ. Let us see Christ in the scriptures, Lord. And then uh, let others see Christ in us, that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.